Welcome back to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast. On today's episode, we've got something that's really exciting. Uh, we found an old diamond call between Bill Glazer and Dan Kennedy. And those who know Bill Glazer, he was the, um, the original owner of Dan Kennedy's company. When Dan sold it originally, Bill Glazer was the person who purchased it. And he took that company and blew it up. And um, over the years, there were a lot of amazing calls that Dan and Bill did where Bill was asking Dan questions. And this is when we found in the archives. It was so powerful and so timely. The title of this presentation was How to Create a Compelling Message that Practically Forces Prospects to Stop What They're Doing and to Take Notice. Now, that's obviously important, probably even more so in today's market than it was when Bill uh, originally interviewed Dan on this topic, because nowadays people have so many more distractions. You know, back then it may have been, you know, uh, direct mail, phone calls, and a couple of things like that, where today we've got TikTok and we've got Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and all the distractions. And so more so now than ever, it's very, very vital and important for all of us to create compelling messages that cut through all of the noise, all of the, the other messages that our dream customers are hearing. And like I said, this in this uh, interview, you have a chance to learn how to do that and how to do it in a way that, again, as Dan said, that practically forces prospects to stop what they're doing and take notice. So I hope you enjoy this interview from Bill Glazer and Dan Kennedy. I don't think there's anybody that has had a bigger impact in the field of direct response than Dan Kennedy. The legend of Dan Kennedy should be ignored at your own peril. They're not really lessons, they're kind of laws that you live by. Dan opened my eyes to what small business marketing looks like. Dan teaches strategic direct response that is timeless. His ripple effect touches people who don't even know his name. The world as we know it was changed because Dan Kennedy became obsessed with marketing. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with your host, Dan Kennedy. Hello, everyone. This is Bill Glazer bringing you another one of our Diamond uh, telecoaching calls. And uh, this month, our... Um, our call is how to create a compelling message that practically forces prospects to stop what they're doing and take notice. Uh, Dan is with me. Dan, how you doing? I'm doing great. Great. So uh, let's dig right in, okay? First question to you, Dan, is why do we need to force prospects to actually take notice? Well, I think there's a lot going on. I mean, I think the hurdle today is uh, for attention is really very high. Um, there, there's so much stuff that there's sort of a resistance to being overwhelmed. People feel they're too busy for anything new. Um, uh, Henry Kissinger's old quote, it can't be a crisis until next Tuesday because I have, I'm fully booked. <laughs> um, I, I think that's, you know, I think that's really going on with people. They're, I like to say that their pipes are clogged with junk. Um, you know the statistic um, in 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 the 1970s was that the average mailbox had five pieces of junk mail or sales material <coughs> in it in an average day. And not only has that number gone up, but of course there's 50 or 500 uh, emails and you know everything else to pay attention to at the same time and. They're embedded with videos and links, and people are trying to uh, pay attention to what's going on on Facebook. And, and with that, you've got the ease of deletion, the ease of being ignored, the lowered barriers to entry, so there's a lot more clutter. Um, I mean, it used to cost money to do marketing. Now, of course, there's a lot of marketing that can at least be begun, entire businesses begun, um, and enter the fray uh, with very little cost, so the barrier is a lot lower. And then I think you add to all of that uh, the impact of what you rather graciously identified or gently identified as a roller coaster economy. Um, there's a there's almost a predetermination on people's part not to put themselves in positions of temptation. So uh, just as I might route my my errands so that I don't drive past a donut shop, uh, m many people are simply trying not to spend, and the best way they know not to spend is not to be exposed to anything. 
uh, that might cause them to spend. So you have a certain avoidance activity going on. And when you add all that together, um, as I said, the, hurdles, the hurdle for attention is pretty damn high. Um, and uh, somehow standing out in all of that clutter and confusion um, is really about forcing prospects to pay attention. Well, you know, before I ask you my next on-topic question, I have a non-on-topic question to ask you because, out of curiosity, because for years I've been hearing about this temptation to not stop every time you drive past a donut shop. And just out of curiosity, how often does the donut shop win? Not very often anymore uh, <laughs> because um, the more of that stuff you trim out of your diet, the the sicker it, it, it makes you and the quicker it makes you sick when you put it back in. So uh, it doesn't win very much anymore. Maybe four times last year. Um, um, the other item of the same ilk would be a milkshake and maybe about the same number of times, four times last year, because I really do have a severe adverse reaction to them now. Right. Um, that doesn't really stop the desire, incidentally, but uh, but, the, but the price to be paid is higher. You know, what's interesting about the answer to that question is that I think if we if we visit with the members a week after this call, they'll remember that stat better than anything else we teach on this call. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll go further. Uh, there will be people who will now go eat a donut or drink a milkshake who would not have otherwise because of the conversation. Just because of the mention of it. Yeah. Yeah. So and let's get back on topic again. So uh, in, in looking at, you know, how to um, create this compelling message, I know that you often talk about, there's two components to creating the best strategy to do, to do this, which is one is the who and the other is the what. So can you just comment about both of them, the who and the what? Yeah, most people start with the second rather than the first. And so where most people start is I've got a wagon of red bricks or, 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 or blue rocks, and now I've got to figure out how to sell my red bricks. And after I figure out, all the great things I can say about the red bricks, then finally, gee, I wonder who might want a red brick. And uh, th that makes the whole process pretty tough sledding. Uh, obviously, there are times where you have no choice but to begin there. But most of the time, we have greater flexibility. And so in, in forcing people to stop and pay attention, it is extremely useful to have picked someone in the first place um, who can be stopped and can be forced to pay atten attention. A and in big, broad, general terms, there's responsive and unresponsive people and responsive and unresponsive prospects. But beyond that, um, I, I, I think that uh, most business owners and marketers do not spend enough time and attention on trying to be for somebody specific so that when that person sees them, hears from them, uh, they, are, they, they are instantly stopped because something has appeared of great personal relevance and great interest um, rather than trying to be all things to all people. Uh, so I talk a lot about aiming for the responsive um, and being for somebody specific uh, so that they are going to be responsive to you, and finally aiming at those who will respond in the way you need them to respond. Um, and, and so, if you if you back through that, um, first of all, people respond in different ways. It's why the simplistic example is often um, customers who rent lists of TV buyers direct response TV commercial buyers or TV infomercial buyers, and then mail to them in direct mail uh, are often very disappointed at the results um, as opposed to mailing to a list of direct mail buyers. Uh, if you need people to come into a room to be sold, they better be people who will come in a room 
and ideally they're people who regularly and routinely come into a room. So if you think about that for info marketing, for example, dentists go to a lot of seminars. By comparison, MDs go to hardly any. So if you need to sell something in a room, you're in for tougher sledding if you're going to sell it to MDs than you are to dentists because they really don't respond the way you need or want them to respond as to who the responsive is. And I don't remember now, and I neglected to find it before the call, but uh, either in a look over my shoulder recently or an info letter, I know I used it also at a seminar um, there, Pastor Warren, Rick Warren. Yeah, it was. A, I think it was an info uh, info letter. Was it info letter? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, big mega church. If people don't know him for any other reason, they may know him because he's the one that got Obama and McCain to come to his church and at the same time and uh, have a discussion on stage. But a huge mega church uh, marketer and a uh, big blockbuster best-selling book. I think it's probably still on the New York Times list, uh, The Purpose Driven Life. Well, he, he has a book for uh, for his, well, for, he has a course for his affiliated church owners, but then he has a book really for any any pastor called The Purpose Driven Church. And it's a marketing book. So, by the way, it's worth reading for anybody who markets at the local level, uh, just as a local church does. And uh, one of the most interesting things about the book is how candid and forthright and detailed he is in describing what many people would consider very predatory practices um, about knowing exactly who is likely to be responsive to them and who isn't, and then targeting the responsive and ignoring the unresponsive, and then making messages that are for those specific likely to be responsive people and there's a profile of their ideal um, uh, I'll use the word customer uh, in the book and there's a checklist of things that make people responsive to them such as uh, 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 trouble in the marriage uh, recent diagnosis of disease with someone in the family um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's instructive because it comes from some place you would not necessarily expect, very sophisticated, targeted, and if you like predatory marketing, really being good about all this. Um, and, and so since it's there, uh, maybe it's easier to understand it and transfer it to, to another business. But certainly the best strategy I know for being paid attention to starts with focusing on the who is going to pay attention uh, rather than the what it is that you want them to pay attention to. So and you kind of alluded to, to it already, but obviously there's, you know, there's this, this whole process in people's minds often gets sabotaged. So what do you see as the most common ways that this does get sabotaged in, in putting together this compelling message. Well, there'll be a there'll be a message to market mismatch uh, one way or the other, and so for certain things the market might be fine, and for certain things the message might be fine, but when these two are put together, uh, there's a fatal flaw in them that causes them not to work at all or not to work very well. One, that is an increasingly common uh, mistake, has to do with generational differences with marketing to uh, to leading age boomers the same way you market to 30 or 40 year olds, with marketing to seniors the same way you market to leading age boomers. Um, I, I, I'm working on a book like a marketing the fluent book um, uh, about this right now um, and I'm working with several clients who market to leading edge boomers and seniors and not surprisingly the members of the client company or client group who are under the age of 40 uh, make a lot of mistakes uh, because 
they don't get what their actual customer is all about, and vice versa, of course. So, you know, generational issues are a very easy way to kind of muck this up. Um, very similar is being um, off the mark with their with your prospect or company's uh, client group, customer groups, sort of tribal language and symbols and a tribal code uh, so that you get yourself immediately marked as an outsider and at many times an offensive outsider. Um, and, and so if you do get attention, it's damn short-lived and it's negative. Um, maybe one of the best examples um, and, and it sort of shows you how a little thing can have big impact. Years ago, a company called Smart Practice right now, they they began as a company called Semantodontics, and they sold um, pretty much everything advertising, marketing, and practice building related to dentists. So that's everything from our kind of product, information courses, training, down to recall, pre-done recall cards and pre-done patient newsletters and imprinted pens and pads and you name it. And uh, they decided to expand into uh, chiropractic. And they built their first catalog, and they pretty much changed all the language to be chiropractic. But either out of ignorance or laziness or speed or cost, they used the same photographs they had in their other catalog. So all of the imprinted stuff, most of it, had a doctor's name with DDS after it. Now, that wouldn't be deadly. But some of the photographs, for whatever reason, and it would not be deadly with Dennis, had MD after the name. And it might not be quite as deadly today as it was 30 years ago, but uh, chiropractors and medical doctors did not get along. And as a matter of fact, the AMA was suing the chiropractic profession at the time, trying to put them out of existence. And generally speaking, all you had to do was say MD within range of a chiropractor and, you know, you were on their death list. And so this catalog did very, very poorly, uh, much to their surprise. But I understood it within 30 seconds of skimming the pages and seeing the photograph. So, you know, there's, there's these kind of mistakes and then I guess the last one I would mention really has to do with sort of uh, not a mechanical mistake so much, but a assumptive mistake, a sense of a title, entitlement and assumption that you are going to be paid attention to because you ran an ad or sent somebody a letter or made a video and stuck it up online or sent out an email, that the very act that you did it and it contains content that you believe should be of interest to the people it was aimed at, that it will be paid attention to. And looping all the way back to the beginning of our call, it's a very poor assumption. And so I think increasingly we have to be not only cautious of it, but go to great extremes to, to avoid it, to, uh, to, to get people to pay attention to ask them to pay attention, to nudge them into paying attention, uh, never really assuming that they will pay attention. So um, now I'm going to ask everybody who's on the call right now, is if you don't have in front of you, uh, and provided that you're not driving around in your car and listening to this call live, but if you're sitting at a place, if, if you don't have in front of you, get out a pad, and pen if you haven't already been taking notes because we're about to ask Dan next really would suggest taking some notes. If you're receiving this CD after the call, again, and you're driving around, don't do it when you're driving around, but then go to a place afterwards and listen to this next part with pad and pen in hand because, you know, people really love checklists. You know, it's like sort of like a a formula for people. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a quick checklist question, Dan. So, so let's go over a checklist of some of some compelling messages, or some 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 winning ways to create a compelling message. Okay. All right. Um, I think there's four big 
keys. So there's you have to be concerned with the means you use of getting attention. So you have a chance. Then you have to be concerned with presentation. Um, my third key would be some version of the unique selling proposition. Um, and my fourth key would be the offer. And that either includes or separately gets all the way to a fifth key of response instruction. So if you go back now and sort of fill in those blanks, um, the the list I rely on most for means of getting attention, so you have a chance, um, is uh, it, it, there's drama and or fear. Um, there's breaking news or a link to news. And those two things sometimes go together, not necessarily. There's the big giant promise. Um, there's the classic uh, new and improved, which is the ultimate oxymoron. Um, can't be improved if it's new, and it can't be new if it's being improved, but nonetheless, for 60-some-odd years, new and improved has worked in advertising. Uh, there's free. Um, there's profound specificity um, and personal relevance. Um, so if you're a if you're a one-legged uh, uh, golfer with asthma, um, also missing a thumb on your left hand uh, with bad vision, who wants to play on the senior tour, and you somehow got an envelope that said, if you're a one-legged golfer with asthma, also missing a thumb on your left hand and really bad vision and want to play on the senior tour, this is for, for you. Uh, that piece would leap out of your mail stack at you because of the profound specificity. There's a celebrity and celebrity endorsement. Um, and I have to tell you one of the funniest things going on right now in the celebrity, celebrity endorsement world. Um, uh, Kim Kardashian, and most people know the Kardashians are essentially brand licensors more than they are anything else and um, brought in $28 million last year and are on pace to do between 55 and $60 million this year. So they, ha they have a brand to protect. And so um, Old Navy, the clothing store chain, is being sued by Kim Kardashian because they're running TV commercials with a Kim Kardashian lookalike in them. This will interest you, Bill, because, of course, you used to use voice you know, celebrity voice impersonators. And, I mean, this woman looks exactly like Kim Kardashian. And um, they're selling generic clothes that match the kind of clothes that are in a licensed Kim Kardashian line with another retailer. Um, but what may have sparked the lawsuit more than anything else is Kim Kardashian's ex-boyfriend is now dating the Kim Kardashian lookalike who appears in the Old Navy uh, TV commercial. Uh, but uh, the Kim Kardashian lookalike in a 60-second TV commercial, by the way, works just as well. She's not going to speak. She works just as well as the real Kim Kardashian. So Old Navy's uh, created a little firestorm here. And then last on the list would be some kind of entertainment or gimmick, and most people are familiar with that more than anything else with grabbers and lumpy objects and toys in boxes and so forth. So those things individually or uh, hooked together in concert are the best means I know of getting that initial head turn, uh, few moments of attention paid so that you have a chance now to move from attention to interest, uh, to, to getting someone now to set aside what they're doing physically or at least mentally, um, and, and give you some undivided attention for a long enough period of time that you can really deliver a marketing message. So, so you covered the first key, which is means. So you want to move on to uh, presentation? Yeah, so. so now if you get that opportunity, now you're going to present yourself, your company, your product, and, and you need to do it in the most relevant way possible which, of course, 
loops back to the who, um, there's a whole school of uh, called reason why advertising that really gets to the issue of relevance. And so there's reasons why your thing, um, your it, uh, exists. Um, uh, there, there's a reason why your particular version of that thing should be of interest to somebody. So why should they have any interest in a garden hose? And then you move to why should they have any interest in a garden hose that uh, has an automatic doohickey on it that conserves water, and when you're done with it, it coils itself back up. Um, and then why should that particular person have an interest in that particular garden hose? And finally, the reason why that particular person should have an interest in that particular garden hose at this particular minute. Um, and, and, and that's essentially as good of a way to dissect and then assemble a, a, a marketing message as any. So then the third key is the uh, unique selling pr proposition. Yeah, which probably everybody on the call is, um, you know, at least conceptually familiar with. It's the chief kind of proposition on a whole list of types of propositions. And um, it's essentially unimportant until you've interested somebody in your category of product or service. And uh, and then it's really important to move them from anybody's thing as interchangeable commodity to yours and yours only. And it's also, if you're very successful at marketing, it's it's a critically impo important key to avoid just being a market maker for other people. Um, some a few kinds of businesses sort of give up and live with that reality. So what I was told some years ago by a VP of marketing at uh, Coors is that all the beer advertising on TV doing a sporting event does nothing to move market share from one beer brand to the other. Uh, all of it in aggregate in an entire year d during televised sporting events do nothing to change market share. What they do is make somebody want a beer, and they get up off the chair, and they go use up the beer they have in their refrigerator, and they buy more. So really, all the advertisers are being market ma makers for for all the advertisers. Uh, they really are just selling beer. But in most worlds, that's not the way you want to approach business. You don't really want to be using your ad dollars to stimulate sales for other people, and um, and and the barrier to that, the prevention to that, the antidote to that, is a really, really, really strong, unique selling proposition so that when you advertise and market, you wind up being the only the only choice for the person you've aimed your, your advertising at. Um, as you know, there's all sorts of other propositions, too. There's unique value proposition. There's unique timing proposition. There's unique price proposition. Um, and, and all of those have to be considered. But the big key still is, um, you know, why should I do business with you versus any and every op other option available to me, including uh, doing nothing? What's the unique selling proposition? So um, le let's leap over the fourth key, which is the offer, and then I'm going to come back to it because I want to I want to the fifth key, we should only take a moment to explain, then we'll go back in more depth into the whole offer thing. So the fifth key is response instructions. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 so many people screw this thing up, but why don't you just talk about that for a second? Well, I mean, you're right. A lot of people leave it off. <laughs> um, or, you know, they make they make assumptions again. Um about what people are going to do, what people know how to do, what people are willing to think through on their own to do. Um, I have an appointment at a business on um, on Monday, and I've only been there once before, and it's been a year since I've been there. And um, so, uh, so yesterday I called up to get directions, 
because the confirmation notice they sent me has no map and no directions. And um, so I get transferred to somebody to take care of this who immediately upon hearing the question, A, confesses to me they're not very good at directions. Um, really can't tell me how to get from where I am to where they are. Told me they're just right across the street from the Nestle plant, and surely I know where the Nestle plant is, which I don't, nor could I give a damn where the Nestle plant is. And then because my guess is she's 30, in a very frustrated tone of voice, she said, well, why don't you just map quest it? Now, there's like nine mistakes in that, presuming you want to get money from me. Now, if you don't care about getting any money from me, then there's no mistake. And you're perfectly entitled to your opinion that I ought to know where the Nestle plant is and that I ought to be using MapQuest and that I ought to have a GPS, but you're not entitled to that opinion if I have the money you want. Um, uh, And so everybody makes these mistakes all the time. They make them on order forms. They make them on confirmation notices for appointments. Um, they make them on seminar announcements locally that are bringing people to a hotel that, oh, everybody knows where that hotel is. Um, they make them uh, by not saying that a toll-free number is a toll-free number, um, and then at its core, not telling people exactly what to do and how they are expected to do it. And um, and response almost always goes up with clear and complete response instructions. Um, I can tell you, in selling from the front of the room, it's a real variable. The order form itself and the response instruction about what to do at the end. And like at the Peter Lowe events, I mean, it is something I did experiment with. Exactly what to say at the end of that speech uh, to get people up and moving in the right direction and filling out forms and so forth. So it it really is an important and often ignored or screwed up key. So let's let's go back to key number four, which is the offer. Um, And um, obviously um, the best approach to the offer is is developing into what we, we term an irresistible offer. So talk a little about sort of how you put together an irresistible offer, and then maybe we'll even do a little bit more further in-depth conversation on that. Well, uh, I think there's three main components. So one is the product or service, the stuff, um, uh, the bonuses, you know, what's being sold and and what's being gifted with sale. Um, And the more personally relevant that is, uh, the more appealingly titled it is, uh, everything that can be done to make that appealing so much the better. The second component is price. And for an irresistible offer, price has to feel like um, um, an unbelievable but made believable bargain. Um, it, It has to feel like Uh, a really wise investment. It has to feel like like what I call the brain-dead price, where um, everything else considered, product, bonuses, service, warranty, relevance to me, et cetera, everything else considered, now this price is a no-brainer price. You would have to be an idiot not to grab it before the seller changes their mind. So there's price. And then last, there's urgency. Uh, What is it about this irresistible offer that mandates taking advantage of it uh, with no delay and no hesitation right this minute? And so those are the three, I guess, boxes you work in um, or that I work in. Uh, when I'm when I'm sitting down to 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 build an offer. So, so, and again, I, I think that people just sort of do not. They come up with bad offers or, or certainly not strong enough offers. So I wanted to dig into this a little bit more. And um, 
so, and some of this I, you might actually repeat when I ask you this question, but be, repeat what you've already said. But so when you focus, when you personally focus on the offer, so what are some of the things that you have on your sort of checklist of things that you think about in terms of crafting this offer? Well, the big goal is clarity. So that kind of hooking offer and response instruction together so that people understand it. There are a few instances when actually you're selling and you don't want them to understand it, but they're few and far between. For the most part, you do want them to understand what they're buying and why they're buying and all of that. And so clarity. And that gets more and more dicey and difficult the more component parts, the more moving parts, the more the more complexity there is to the offer. Uh, but complexity and clarity do not necessarily have to be uh, mutually exclusive. One is just a challenge to the other. But generally speaking, the confused um, and uncertain consumer tends to do nothing. So clarity is a biggie. Choices biggie i am this is to me so basic and yet i am consistently amazed at how many advertisers marketers sellers put one yes or no choice out in front of the prospect um uh, doesn't matter whether it's a chiropractor or a dentist presenting a treatment program or it's you know a salesman of a consumer product um, on and on. It's amazing to me, a financial plan from an advisor, uh, how, how many put one choice out there, um, thereby uh, creating a yes or no circumstance. When simple math tells you that you improve the odds of a yes if there are three yes choices and only one no choice to choose from, uh, or two yes choices and one no choice. There's also a whole side issue there um, discussed in length in the price strategy book, but about uh, the net profitability of a a premium choice and so forth. Um, There's the description of the core product or the service, and what that ought to be out of everything in the basket versus what ought to be bonuses, premiums, what added value can be created. Um, and so if we got a red brick and a blue rock, which ought to be the product and which ought to be the bonus, um, and obviously much more complicated than that, do we emphasize the service with less emphasis on the tangible goods or do we emphasize the tangible goods with less emphasis on the service? Um, I noticed an auto dealer the other day, an Infinity dealer here. Um, I noticed a, a sharp change in their TV commercials. There's no way to know if it's intelligence or accidents. I, it just, it's just interesting that they're running a TV commercial that says almost nothing about the car but is entirely about the service after the sale. And the biggest thing they're emphasizing that I have not noticed them emphasizing before is that they have a fleet of 50 um, uh, loaners? Uh, infinity loaners, yeah. so of the same brand that you're buying, loaners, um, and that they will bring you the loaner car and pick up your car and bring your car back. Um, so they've they've really switched from showing the car and talking about the car, the product, if you will, to talking about the service. So there's that whole, the technical term for all this is waiting. How much weight, not waiting like procrastinating, but waiting like fat. How much weight you put on product, how much weight you put on service, how much weight you put on bonus. Does the bonus drive the sale, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I guess last would be the risk reversal element. How do we make it risk-free to buy? How much emphasis do we put on the risk-free aspect of our offer? 
Um, is there one guarantee? Are there two guarantees? Are there three guarantees? Um, are they money back guarantees? Are they double money back guarantees? Are they? Um, uh, are they? Is it positioned as free trial, regardless of whether in fact it is free trial or not? Um, all of those, all of those risk reversal issues. So again, before before we move on to the next question, but um, you know. We just went over the, the five keys to sort of what makes up a compelling message, and I really urge everybody to listen to this over and over again, take copious notes, and then when you create that message, go get out your notes and make sure you're following this along because it's a game changer in terms of getting people to respond. So um, the next question is... Um, uh, in presenting um, price, how can you sort of? And I know you just you have a brand new book out on price that you co-authored with Diamond member Jason Mars. But how can price? How can you sort of turn it into sort of your friend as opposed to your enemy when you're presenting? Because so everybody it, from the world that I came from, which was retail, and then every other niche I've ever seen that I've worked with. Almost everybody is is so fearful of price, so because they think price is going to really you know kill their sales. How can you again make price your friend and not your enemy? Yeah, you're, you're right. People people act like price is a terrorist, <laughs> and, and 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 they really are afraid of it. And and I think every beginner is, um, you know. But you kind of need to get over it. Um, you, you you said it in an important and accurate way that um, price is best presented, not just stated, and certainly not disclosed only under duress. Um, and so um, not only shouldn't it make you anxious, but it really can't appear to the prospect or the customer to be making you anxious. Um, I think that when you present price, you always have to think about timing, where in the overall presentation you put it. You have to think about context, um, which, for example, you never allow apples to apples comparisons. You always create apples to oranges comparisons that make your price seem substantially less than value and make it impossible to compare it directly to some other price. So there's context. Um, there's uh, how low can you go um, in the way it feels without it feeling so low that that in and of itself produces anxiety, you know, that the price is incongruent with the positioning or really causes somebody to question value. Um, the and and you're very well aware of them, and um, and competed with the Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Banks and those guys of the world. <coughs> Where I live, at least right now, Joseph A. Bank is one of the most aggressive TV advertisers um, I think I've ever seen uh, in clothing, and. They're very big on incredible, um, I think the last thing I saw the other day was uh, buy one, get two free. So buy a suit, get two free sport coats, buy a pair of pants, get two pair of pants and, and a sport coat. I mean, just insane. And at some point I wonder... Well, it certainly attracts one kind of customer and I think repels another kind of customer. Um, and and I wonder at what point they do themselves more harm than good because people start to wonder if the stuff is any good. Uh, so, you know, I think that's all an issue. And so the presentation of price is at least as important as the presentation of product. It's not an oh, by the way. It's not something to be hidden. Um, but it, And it is something to be to have context created for. Well, I just out of curiosity, so what about if if the price is so compelling? 
because you mentioned before the fact that you don't you usually don't lead with it. You 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 don't present it until later in the, in the proposition. But what about if the price itself is just such an unbelievable price that that would be very compelling to people? At that point, would you would you say that you could lead with it? Could. Um, there are actually two times when you will see an advertiser or seller lead with price. One is the scenario you just described, when it is uh, such an obvious bargain, um, such an amazing, incredible bargain. Uh, the other is actually when it is profoundly expensive. Um, and really now that price is being used as marketplace differentiation and has call out to a certain kind of customer. Um, and you, there are classics over the years of successful advertisements where literally the, the lead focus of the ad is here's the most expensive blank um, ever made, ever sold, ever offered. Um, and so uh, both of those scenarios pro- provide opportunity and reason to lead with price, and so you can, uh, and you can do so successfully. It's still not, I'm still not inclined to do it very often. Um, I, I'm still more inclined to want to set it up um, and tell the story um, rather than actually be selling based on the price. Uh, but, um you know, there's, look, there's a very successful campaign. Um, it comes out normally during bad economic times very aggressively and is dormant or hardly used during good times. But uh, And there's been variations of it over decades. It's an opportunity kind of pitch, and it is about um, how to buy homes for $5, how to buy a car for a dollar. Um, and it's about government seizures of stuff from drug dealers and uh, things left behind in at freight companies and storage sheds and bank foreclosures of properties. And you will see very aggressive advertising that is totally focused on price. Um, look, somebody got a Mercedes for 50 bucks. Um, and if you have this information or if you come to this auction or if you go to this website, you'll find hundreds of homes that you can buy for $500 or less in good neighborhoods all across America. And you'll find cars that you can buy brand new, less than 10,000 miles on them, still under warranty for $500 or less. Well, that, that's a, they're totally selling price. And they feel that, that that's the, the best path they have to commanding attention from the marketplace and they may very well be right. My big fear with it for businesses that you intend to sustain over time has to do with, A, how you've sort of conditioned the customer that now that you have them, is that the only way you're going to be able to sell to them again? Um, And B, does it just mark you as a price seller? And over time, almost all who sell by price ultimately do die by price. So th- those are my concerns. But there's no doubt that it's a strategy that can work. So um, before we open up for some Q&A, um, and I want to do want to leave a fair amount of time for that, um, I do want to go back, Dan, because we're, we're running at a pretty good pace. I want to go back and, and spend a little bit of time with you, getting into a little more depth with the list you get out as far as some of the means of getting attention. Um, so, uh, to, so we'll we'll go through those sort of like one by one, and then we'll I'll go through as many of those as we can until we have to go over to Q and A. Um, but before we do that, I do just want to make one announcement that that all Diamond members um, uh, should be very interested in, which is on November the second. Um, the night before the Info Summit in Atlanta, we'll be having our next Diamond Networking Dessert Reception that evening. Um, 
uh, at the event hotel. And uh, all Diamond members are welcome to come uh, absolutely for free. Um, you do not have to be attending the Info Summit, although most that will be there will be staying November the 3rd through the 5th for the Info Summit. And then the day after, November 6th, for the Social Media Money Magnet Bonus Day. But certainly everybody who, who, sh who can be there should be there. It's a, it's a very, very terrific opportunity to get to promote yourself and also look for people that you can actually um, reach out to and develop relationships with uh, to help you to grow your businesses. And in many cases, some of the best JVs in the world are created in that room. So I mentioned that on November the 2nd. Again, that's free. That's included in your Diamond membership um, uh, benefits. So, Dan, let's go back to the list. So the first item on the list that you get as far as means of getting attention, and, I'll, again, you know, we can try to go through these as quick a pace as possible. The first one is drama fear. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's one of my favorite. This actually the second part, the fear part. <laughs> yeah, well, overall, fear of loss uh, motivates more purchasing and more response than does anything else. Um, uh, relatively small percentages of populations are ambitious for gain, but virtually 100% of every population uh, reacts adversely to having things they have taken away from them. So fear of loss is very, very powerful. And when it is presented in a very dramatic way, it's doubly powerful. Right now, um, uh, modified since some FTC chain rattling in the past six months, but the gold industry, if you pay attention to the advertising of the gold industry, um, financial newsletter marketers, again, bad economies, uh, uh, really cranks up those industries' efforts, and they are very much uh, fear mongerers. Um, and so the talk is about uh, how the government is scheming to take away your whatever, you know, your retirement benefits, your guns, your your retirement benefits and your guns. Um, shocking and relevant statistics, amazing stories that are incredibly dramatic. Um, these, uh, you know, these have made the tabloid industry uh, what it is. Um, the, uh, these have made cable news... Uh, you know, what it is, um, and it sells an awful lot of product. So the next one that you mentioned, um, and actually, by the way, if I could just make a, a side about this, before I, I move it to the next one, that oftentimes these exact same means of getting attention that Dan is mentioning in terms of creating a message, as oftentimes we use these exact same lists and when we, when we create headlines, so it's, it, it works the same equally well there as it does even in your compelling message. So the next one is the, the breaking news. Um, uh, talk about that. Well, uh, breaking news has become wildly overused on cable television. But, um, but still, when the breaking news banner runs across the TV screen, uh, uh, people perk up. Um, David Ogilvy said that, you know, the heart and soul of great advertising is news. Um, we, are, we are sort of conditioned to pay attention to what is news. And so when you present um, yourself uh, has either news or linked to news that is very current, very timely, uh, you you can gain it. You can gain an edge in in grabbing that attention for long enough now to try and move from attention to interest. Um, uh, the news links to certain uh, constituencies are even more powerful because of personal relevance. So you know, uh, a new medical breakthrough for type two diabetics that uh, put out there as a marketing message will get zero attention from just about anybody but type 2 diabetics, but it is extremely effective at getting attention uh, from type 2 diabetics. Uh, today, Congress officially declared war on 401Ks um, is likely to get 
zero attention from people that don't have 401ks, but is likely to get uh, profound attention from people who do have 401ks. So uh, when you take breaking news and you target it to a constituency, um, you have a very powerful means of getting attention. Well, the next one is the uh, the giant promise. Um, and, um, you know, again, I'm going to ask you to talk about it, but um, I would also like you to, to also just briefly mention about not only some examples of people that have done giant promise, but, but I've also seen it work uh, adversely at times. So can you talk about any caution about when doing it, when's the right way to do it, and when's, what's the wrong way to do it? Well, the danger in it is it's, it's uh it's unbelievability so you know we can probably without a lot of uh of sweat we could probably convince people that uh secret millionaires are running around um this month uh giving out money to deserving people and so if you will put a sign in your yard um, with, the, with the reason in 146 characters or less that you ought to be chosen, there's a possibility that a secret millionaire will choose you. We could probably get a lot of signs put out. It'll be harder if we make the story about secret millionaire aliens from another galaxy who have come here to hand out free money this month to deserving people who have signs in their yards. Now, depending on who we aim that at, um, we may still be able to get some signs put in the yards, but, you know, we made our job a little tougher. Uh, Generally speaking, though, we marketers will be more sensitive to that danger than the danger actually exists because people are quite willing to set aside uh, sanity and rationality for for a promise that they really want. Uh, money promises, um, uh, you know, the the four-hour work week, its predecessors like Carbo's Lazy Man with Way to Riches, even executives. I mean, a, a huge best-selling book was The One-Minute Manager. And it's a big promise, especially if you translate it literally. Um, and yet, on a rational level, if you've ever managed anybody, you instantly know that there, there is no one-minute management of anything, of anybody, any way, shape, or form. But still, it's a big attention-getting promise. Um, the best headline still uh, of all time uh, is a headline is a classified ad called uh, "It's Corn's Gone in Five Days or Money Back. And uh, it's a big promise. It has a meaningful specific of a number of days. It has a guarantee all packed into it. Um, That's a great way to deliver a promise. Um, I'm going to skip over new and improved, um, uh, only because I want to make sure there's a couple of the gamuts on here I want to discuss. Uh, One of them I really want to discuss is uh, is the entertainment gimmick one. Uh, I should. I, I actually, let me, let me just stick. Let me just keep it at entertainment right right now before we even get the gimmick. Is um, um, I think you would agree, Dan. One of the great examples that all of our members have seen where we have embraced this is in the uh, special uh, sixteen page um, uh, No BS in, in national International Enquirer marketing piece that we put together to promote the Info Summit, and you and I actually. Uh, uh, we recorded an entire call for our Copy Confidential Look Over Your Shoulders members who to sort of explain the whole process that went into that. But because this is one that, again, is not used nearly enough. So talk about the advantages of trying that entertainment, you know, you know gimmick type of approach to why that would get people to take notice. Well, I view it as a way to um, buy permission uh, to sell and, in a sense, to obligate it because people very much like to be entertained, Um, maybe more than anything else. 
uh, on the planet. Uh, last weekend, in a nation with 9% unemployment, 18% functional unemployment, if you faction in underemployment, uh, real estate in a dumper, every economic you know, fact of life not good, um, uh, the new Harry Potter movie took in $186 million uh, in three days. Uh, there are entire companies um, going through gyrations of manufacturing product, distributing product, selling product, with product on the shelf of every store in its category in America who won't do $186 million in business this entire year. Um, and it is significant that it is an en- entertainment product that does it. So um, I- 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 people very much like to laugh, chuckle, have a good time, be entertained, be amused. And so when it can be done uh, and care taken not to have it overwhelm the selling, um, then I often do it. And I view it as a way to uh, sort of the trade, the ethical bribe, if you will, of I want you to pay attention to my sales message, but I'll at least make it kind of fun and interesting and entertaining for you to do so. And, and, and that really is the theory. Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with Dan Kennedy. If you love hearing in on these lost Dan Kennedy talks and speeches and calls, then please let someone else know about this podcast. That's how you can help it to grow. And the more it grows, the more free Dan Kennedy we can bring to you. Also, Dan would love to give you the most incredible free gift ever designed to help you make maximum money in minimum time. Now, this free gift comes with almost $20,000 in pure money-making information for free just for saying maybe. You can get this gift from Dan right now at nobsletter.com. Not only will you get the $20,000 gift, you're also going to get a subscription to two marketing newsletters that will be hand-delivered by the mailman to your mailbox each and every month, one from Dan Kennedy and one from me, Russell Brunson. To get this gift and your subscription, go to nobsletter.com right now.